Hey everybody. Hey everybody. We are back with another episode of Resilient, Resilient Love. Love. And we have our awesome special guest with us, Miss Melissa. Hey, Miss Melissa. Hey, what's up? Welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yes, thank you for thank being you. here. So, um, Melissa, before we jump into this segment, we want everybody to know a little bit about you. So go ahead and share with our audience who you are. Hey, everybody. My name is Melissa Miller. I am a former certified nursing assistant. I did that work for 15 years prior to becoming a full-time stay-at-home mother and full-time spousal caregiver. Uh, that came about because my husband was diagnosed with epilepsy in 2021, and or excuse me, in 2020. <laughs> dates around here. And um, uh, I have just been sharing my story uh, for, through everything we've been through because I know someone else is going through the same thing. If it can happen to us when we're in our prime, it can certainly happen to somebody else. So making sure that women, caregivers, moms have the types of support and resources that they need to make this transition smoother is my number one priority because I didn't have that because um, this happened for us personally right when the pandemic hit. It hit. We shut down in January, between January and March of 2020. And by May, April into May of 2020, my husband's health was just out of control. He was averaging 10 to 24 seizures a month and his health was just really declining. And so it was just very apparent that we couldn't keep doing things the way we'd been doing them. So I started my transition journey home. Um, at that point wow wow i mean that was just the prelude everybody we're going to get into a little bit more as we continue this conversation but we have started this segment and uh, miss melissa wanted to join in with us to rate your day so i'll start us off i would rate today on a scale of one to five i would give today a four i worked out today I had a nice bottle of water. And in the words of Cora Jakes Coleman and Sarah Jakes, I mind my business. <laughs> so today was a good day. What about you, Q? Uh, mine today is about a four. Okay. Um, I think I got enough time to make it a five. That's right. So it's, it's a four. We worked out. Um, we got started early. We talked. We just kind of had an early morning, but relaxing early morning and then work out. So it's enough time to crunch in and get that five. Mm -hmm. What about you? I would definitely say it's the four as well. Um, I got up early. I let myself sleep in early or um, sleep in late, sleep in late <laughs> an mm -hmm. hour um, because it is Saturday, but I still had some things for work that I wanted to get done. So I started my office hours, my early morning office hours, an hour early. Um, I got my hot cup of coffee in, um, did my motivation reel on Instagram, which always brings me joy to kind of just encourage people as they're starting their day and uh, just feeling aligned with where I'm at. And I got my morning journaling in. So your girl is ready to go. And of course, I got my water to hydrate too. So it's it right. it definitely time to make it a five. So we got this. Yes, we got this. So listen, we got another thing we're going to do for the day. So this is our this or that. So would you rather stay in or go out? Ooh, now that is a complicated question, y'all, because it could, it depends on, I'd have to say it depends on what the activity is for one, just to be brutally honest. And I guess it would depend on whether I'm doing it with by myself or with somebody, if that makes sense. So I don't know. I think if I'm going out for maybe some me time uh, by myself, you know, cool, I'm up for it. Um, if it's something where I could only, if I had to take somebody with me, I definitely would want to take my family, but I don't know if the weather's bad, like we had zero degree weather here and we had snow transitioning out of Christmas into the new year. Um, give me another hot cup of coffee, cozy up with a cozy blanket and watch a movie with my a Disney movie with my little girl. That'd be cool too. So I guess it depends on the, the situation. The situation. The yeah, yes. that's true. That's true. Um, today is definitely a go out day. <laughs> for yes, us yes. <laughs> but typically it's definitely stay in um another one we wanted to ask you would you rather do reading as a traditional reading or audiobook 
I love that's I think that's really interesting that you asked that because um it's interesting like with my dad he has some health issues and so holding a book and reading it and concentrating like that is kind of hard for him so he's loved audiobooks I'm glad they're available personally for me I just because I have so much technology in my life now with my work I really resonate with the idea of doing something that's non-tech related so I love that sentimentality of just taking a book and holding it and turning the pages and cutting cuddling up either on my bed or on, on the couch and just reading a good book you know what I mean mm-hmm. so yeah so I, I I just really love that just having some time to kind of do something that's not tech related right hello we are tech heavy yes all right so we're going to jump right into our questions because we are just excited to learn even more about you all right and so we're going to start with our question uh first question as a wife and a mom how do you find balance with the two roles and how do you stay organized well it has definitely gotten more challenging and complicated since my husband's illness i will be brutally honest with that about that uh the big thing for me i think is just really segmenting my life um i have one thing i've really found that has helped me with balancing it all is especially when you're dealing with a chronic illness that's unpredictable. With seizures, you never know when one's gonna hit, how long it's gonna last. And when it does hit, for those who aren't familiar with epilepsy, for example, Mm -hmm. it wipes you out. It's think of it as you just run a 26 mile marathon. You don't recover from that in a matter of minutes or hours. You probably are out for at least a day or two. So learning to be flexible and just being able to just drop one thing and move on to what I need to do has been the biggest thing, which in the beginning was hard. I'm very much task oriented and type A and want to just get things done. But the thing with being a mom and a spousal caregiver now, especially since I have a toddler and I have a husband that has such an unpredictable illness, I think flexibility and just learning to just be able to pivot in the blink of an eye is the biggest skill that you have to learn to do to balance that. Because if you can't do that, you're going to, it's going to feel overwhelming and you're just going to just crazy. <laughs> I'm wow. I I mean I'm so glad you said that point. You know, actually pivoting at the drop of a dime. That you know that actually brings us to the other point about the pandemic. Like we had to pivot at the drop of a dime. Like who mm-hmm. would have known this pandemic would have just came like it did. And then on top of that, the factors that you share with us thus far. So, you know, I want to know, you know, for moms that start in business, because, you know, I see that you have, you were in one particular field, but then you switch to the at home mom, work from home mom. So how was that switch? And then tell us more about the business itself. Okay. Well, the switch was crazy. Um, <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. OMG, right? Um I, the switch was kind of gradual for me. I will say that it wasn't like right away. Um, My husband started having seizures in December of 2019. Uh, It started out pretty slow. So I didn't like start transitioning home right away. We thought we could just, because we didn't even know it was seizures in the beginning. He just passed out. We thought it was just, maybe he was tired from working 40 plus hour work weeks and having a daughter that was just about to turn one. You know, you get tired when you're dealing with those types of life transitions, right? So January and March, he had an episode. Okay. We didn't think anything of it, but we were starting to see the doctors because maybe it was something neurological. So in the back of my brain, I'm kind of like, okay, what, what is this going to mean for our family? But the turning point, I think for me was in April, April was just a month where all hell broke loose. It was bad. Um, he started that, that was the first month he started averaging from going from just one to three seizures every couple months to 10 to 20 plus a month. Wow. And so that's when I knew that something probably was changed, was going to need to change for our family and that something was really wrong. This wasn't just him being tired. This wasn't just him being exhausted from being a new dad again at, at, in his mid fifties. Cause I will say my husband is 20 years, my senior almost. And so he has a 20 plus year old from the first marriage. So obviously parenting a smaller child at that age is a little different. <laughs> so yeah, we thought it might yeah. be related to that, but it wasn't. And so by May, we had blown through our first medication that was, and our first doctor, he was just a general neurologist and he couldn't do anything other than the standard medication he had. 
So by May, when we switched to our neurologist specialist and we were starting a new regime of medicine, I just knew in my gut that I just needed to stay home. I, I, I just knew that something had to change. So initially though, we thought it would just be until we got him stabilized on medication and we could go back to life as it was, but it just got worse over the summer. So this transition, I think, started then. May into June, I started looking into an online bit, doing something online, remote from home, because I was realizing I just can't be away from home anymore. This is not safe anymore. I have a, we have a small daughter. Uh, my husband is very sick and is unpredictable, and he needs somebody here to be with him adult supervision-wise 24-7. Uh, to make sure that he's safe because he does have to have certain things in terms of medication and just monitoring to make sure he comes out of his seizures. And like, obviously, like if you have a seizure and you thrust your head into something, what about a concussion? What about some sort of other injury on top of the damage that the seizure is doing in of itself to the brain? So there's so many more complicated pieces in the back of your brain that you have to keep in mind when you're dealing with a situation like this. So that was really the turning point, I would say, or the catalyst for me transitioning to be at home. Now, at the time when I started my business, mm -hmm. I didn't really have a clear vision about what I wanted to do. I was, I was doing course hoarding, doing all the things that you, that entrepreneurs shouldn't do. I didn't hire a coach right out the gate, unfortunately, and I didn't have a solid foundation about what I was doing. So I, I went through like four or five different topic ideas for the rest of the year and struggled. I didn't, and I didn't find my business coach until October of 2020, if I remember right. Yeah. So I really struggled and I was trying to reinvent the wheel, which I shouldn't have been because I have a story right in and of itself. I finally figured out in December, hello, <laughs> I have a story that's very complex and unique and it's not being talked about because that was what the one thing that I, I realized it, but I didn't put two and two together. When I was starting my stay-at-home mom and caregiving journey, I was looking for resources for support but because everything was shut down because of the pandemic. But the problem was of the resources that I could find, they were very segmented. So there was stuff for stay-at-home moms, which is good. There was stuff for um, people who are dealing with a particular illness like epilepsy, for example, speaking from what I know. But there wasn't anything for the both together. And there wasn't anything for stay-at-home moms who maybe have prior um, made the choice when they, before their kids even came along that, okay, we're in a situation where it makes more sense. And we want to, we actively are choosing for one of us to stay at home from the day our child is born. Mm -hmm. For us, it was more out of necessity and we didn't have a choice because <laughs> there was a pandemic going on. Mm -hmm. We don't want strangers in our house. Um, we do have family and friends, but you don't want to impact them with the amount of care and supervision my husband needs. I need to have someone here 40 hours a week. There's no way. And with some families thinking of family, they have health issues. So, or they have kids. Hello, there's yeah. no way, there's no way. Yeah. So it was more out of necessity. And with that necessity and no resources, that's, that was the light bulb moment for me that, okay, I have something here that needs to be shared. It's not talked about, and that is not okay. And I certainly as heck do not want another mother, another caregiver, another woman to go through this situation alone like I have, because it's not okay. And it's not okay. And it's on the rise. It's on the rise. Um, I do want to emphasize when we think about caregiving, who do we emphasize that we are going to be caregiving for the most? Our parents, mm -hmm. our grandparents. That's expected because of the age gap and they age and they have more health issues. That's expected. We don't necessarily anticipate having to care for our spouses at a young age. I'm only 36 and my husband's only 55 and he's chronically sick and disabled for the rest of his life. Yeah. Not a lot of people are aware of that. It is on the rise and it is, and it is, and it is shocking to me um, since I started this journey, how many people I've come across that are resonating with the story for one either personally or they have somebody in their life that they know a friend or a colleague that's dealing with a situation like this, but they don't have the resources. Wow. So, and that's not okay. That's not okay. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's so vital. You know, as we were in the pandemic, you were thinking about, first of all, let's face this first battle, the pandemic. Then you're thinking about the home front of your husband and your daughter. So, you know, those were a lot of factors to, that came into play. And I just appreciate how you literally took your story 
and turned it into a profitable business. Right. I don't know. You know, when when life happens, like you're you're showing the resilience of you have to learn how to roll with the punches and kind of just stay in the fight and figure out how to strategize and fight with it. So absolutely. With that being said, in all your experiences, how has that made you more resilient? I think on a, first of all, I will say that um, this kind of stuff impacts you, not just physically, but it does impact you physically or emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. And I've been hit by all four. <laughs> okay. Yes. And I definitely, since I'm going to be brutally honest, I'm putting my hands up, scouts honor, I'm putting my hand up. I did not practice self-care from the beginning. And so I definitely burned out. And by January of 2021, I was really, really sick. I was having a lot more. I have a few chronic health issues in myself. I have hypothyroidism and I had a lot of, I get a lot of gut problems related to that disease. Uh, but then what I had also going on that we finally just got diagnosed to, and I finally got diagnosed with in December was IBS. <laughs> so on top of caregiving, I have my own things. And so I ignored a lot of my, I just thought, okay, it's just probably stress. And I already have, I know I already have gut issues already. I'm eating plant-based. I'm, uh, I'm gluten-free. I'm, you know, I'm doing all these things to take care of my body and hydrating with water. So I put myself on the back burner. So I think the biggest thing I've learned is that you have to, to be able to do this, you have to prioritize yourself because caregiving and motherhood start with you. If you don't take care of yourself, Y'all, you're going to burn out faster than you can say spit. It's just not going to work. It really is not going to work. So I would say the resiliency comes with um, first prioritizing yourself and realizing, okay, it's a buzzword right now. Self-care is not selfish. Self-care is needed and necessary to do this. But then thirdly, um, the resiliency comes with also remembering how, st how strong you are. You are one tough cookie. Okay, whoever's listening to this, you are tough. You are strong you got this, you were handed this. I don't understand. I, I don't understand why things happen the way they do, why God gives us the things that he does, but he does promise to be with us through thick and thin through everything. And that's a, and that's it. And that's a strong encouragement. So with that being said, take care of yourself, keep believing that it will get better mm -hmm. and that you will find your ebb and flow. It might take a while and it's not, and it's not a thing of where once you get something figured out that it's totally set in stone, that you're good for the rest of your journey. It's not, there's different seasons. We've had different seasons with adjusting to my, our daughter's needs as she's grown up. We've adjusted to um, how many seizures my husband has or hasn't had my own health, um, where I'm wanting to level up personally with my business and where I want to project that for 2022. So there's multiple le levels to this journey and multiple levels um, in terms of how you um, grow through this journey. So I, for me, I've gotten closer to, to God. I've um, reconnected with um, some self-care tips that I haven't done for years, like journaling. I used to do a lot of journaling when I was younger, but Ooh. since I have, but I've gotten back into that because I'm realizing, hey, this is a good way for me to brain dump all the crap out of my brain, out of my heart, and just be able to let it go and move forward. Because if you hang, emotions are not meant to be bottled up if that makes sense. We yeah. have to release them to be able to move forward. So even if it's something painful, if you're angry, if you're frustrated, if you're sad, it's, and it's okay. There's, cause there's, here's, here's the other thing. There is grief. Be, if you're going through this journey or you're just starting this journey, y'all be aware that there will be some grief involved. You will feel grief because you're grieving the life that you thought you would have mm. prior to your spouse's illness. Does that you got me. We see where I'm going with this. You have, yeah, to, it's good. You have to have to grieve, and it's okay to grieve. But at the same time, there's hope. Life can still be beautiful. You can still have an amazing marriage, be an amazing mother, and and you can still raise your kids. Like even though my husband's sick, he's an amazing father still. He's still an amazing father, and he's still doing an amazing job, even though he's sick. So just because he's sick doesn't mean he stops being my best friend or he stops being my husband or he stops being my daughter's father. So you, it's still, so you still keep going, okay? It, the roles don't stop just because you get <laughs> hit with this <laughs> un, unthinkable right. diagnosis, okay? But it is possible. 
Wow. That can we just yeah. that was good because grief is a part of the process. And we do not look at grief in that manner. Mm -hmm. We a lot of times we look at it as in a physical loss. But there was a loss, although you probably couldn't touch it, you lost what you thought you were going to get, the life you thought, or the money, or the whatever status. You thought this was going to happen, but you have to grieve that, process that, and as you said, grow through it together. Yes, and formulate a new life mm -hmm. and, and love that and have that hope. I love that keeping the hope alive. And Absolutely. Not hope. Yes. Is your daughter named Hope? No, her she's actually named for um, her name's Linda Elaine. She is named for two very special women in my life. So my aunt Linda passed away uh, just about four months after we were married in April of 2012. We were married in November of 2011, and so I was very close to her. She helped take take care of me a lot when my she she'd fly out to wherever we were living because we lived in different parts of the country um, throughout my childhood because my dad was a pastor, and I have so many wonderful memories of her with her coming to take care of me and just special activities we got to do. So that's where she gets her first name, and then the second her middle name is Elaine, which is my mother's middle name and my middle name. Um, I was adopted. Uh -oh. I was adopted, and so my mother when I was adopted. Uh, she thought it would be fun. She's like, okay, well, our daughter's going to get your last name until she gets married. So I want her to get something of mine. So she just, so they decided it'd be fun for us to have the same middle name. And so when we had, when we found out we were expecting a little girl after our own six year infertility, my parents went through seven years of infertility. And then we tried for six years before we were pregnant. Um, and so my so when we found out we were having a little girl, I was like, I want to do that. I want to do that one more time for one more generation. And that is so precious to me now, since my mom did pass away in September and it, um, after her own 50 year chronic battle with um, health issues. So it has been very precious that she has a name that's from two strong Christian women that are, were just, um, you know, pillars in our family. So that's very precious. Awesome. Well, little Linda, when you see this, <laughs> hey, it's the bakers. <laughs> but that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yes. And I, we just really appreciate how you have taken your business and taken your life, first and foremost, giving it back to God, keeping that faith through the process, and just continuing to show us resilience. You know, this is resilient love. But I see the resilient love through what you shared. Um, so what um what tell us a little bit more about your business. Are you are what's what's next? What's coming up next? What's the name of the business? Okay. Um, well, I'm pretty much branding my business now. Um, I have a website. It's I, I I brand myself as a mom mentor and a slash caregiver support coach. Uh, my web, brand new website, which went live in May of 2021, it's over on Podia, um, Melissa Miller 2011.podia.com. And I am really just shifting more towards coaching and mentoring and teaching the stuff that I was not taught and supporting women um, through creating um, manageable, uh, realistic approaches to their unique journey. Because here's the thing I can teach things and say things 150 times, but it's not about copying me 100% to a T, okay? What works, for, what works for your girl may not 100% work for the next mom, and that's okay. So the idea is I work with, I get, I sit down with a mom and I help her figure out what her strengths are, what, what makes her tick, what little things make her tick, and, and what her family situation is and the ups and flows of how much care she needs to give her husband. Maybe my husband's pretty high functioning, obviously. I mean, he's not bedridden. It's, it's just monitoring for safety, make sure he gets his meds and things like that. He can still work part-time, but he is more tired and fatigued than he used to be. So there's days where I have to help out a lot more and that's okay. But maybe she might have a spouse that's bedridden. So figuring out a way for her to get a system with being able to meet her husband's needs care, caregiving wise, 
but then also being able to have a system with keeping up with the house, keeping up the bills, getting in that needed self-care time um, and figuring out how to not lose herself in these roles, if that makes sense. And so I have a brand new drip course coming out. It hits um, my website on January, Monday, or Monday, January 31st. It'll be a five week drip course where you get modules for five weeks and it's $97 and I'm going to be breaking everything down in topics. So self-care, prioritizing self-care, preparing for the unexpected medical emergencies, flare-ups with your spouse's illness. We need to talk about that stuff. Um, uh, managing your schedule, how to get organized with that and figuring out little bite-sized ways, even if it's just 15 minutes a day to work on that. Um, importance of reaching out for support. And I'm not talking about just people in your church or, or your congregation or faith or family or friends. I'm talking about stuff for like from the state and things like that of other resources you can tap into your community. Um, just things that you normally wouldn't think about when you're going through a situation like this. Insurance. I mean, I'm not an ex, I will do a disclaimer here. I'm not an expert on all that. But I can share like what to be aware of when you're going through the process of things to be aware of because it does feel like you're learning Greek when you're not when you're Italian and so it's really <laughs> it's really it's really overwhelming and so I we go, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna I dive we're gonna be diving really deep into all that kind of stuff and so I'm so excited about that um and then later this year I'll be um relaunching my coaching program my one-on-one -on -one coaching program too so I'm very excited about what I have coming all right go ahead Melissa love it Oh man, well look, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. You have shared so much with us and I want all the moms out there, caregivers out there to make sure that you click the link in our description box so that you can go ahead and get this drip course so that you can be prepared and have all the needed resources because we have someone here, whether she wants to claim it or not, that's an expert. That so she's been through it. And she's sharing from her place of experience, which makes her an expert. <laughs> right. So uh, again, we appreciate you. We have enjoyed this conversation. Any other final comments? Um, just to keep going. Okay. Just remember that you're uh, my my main things. My four things I always tell my mom whenever I end an email or my Instagram lives or, you know, anything like that. I always just for, always leave the, leave with the words. Um, we're doing the best we can. We're allowed to give ourselves grace on the hard mom and caregiver days. We know our families better than anybody else. So that makes us the captain of our ship. Okay. Nobody else knows our families like we do. So don't let her, let anyone else push you around in and putting their, in, or let, or let someone's two cents derail you from what you know is right in your gut for your family because you're the ones that are living through this situation. Nobody else is. Everyone has a filtered view from what they see from the outside. So don't let anyone tell you different, okay? Mm -hmm. And just remember that we're not alone, okay? And I am so passionate and I am so honored that God has given me this opportunity, even amidst all the chaos, to be able to stand in the, to stand in the, in the, in the, in the gap, stand in the gap, to be able to help you through the situation so if you want other like mom tips and stuff check out my instagram handle also at melissa miller 2011 um i do daily lives over there monday through friday and i'm doing a lot of teaching over there right now as i'm get ramping up for my course so there's a lot of good stuff over there if you're feeling stuck if you're feeling overwhelmed or if you're just feeling alone because let's face it when we're still kind of isolated because of the pandemic for one the ongoing pandemic hello, and <laughs> dealing with um, also motherhood and caregiving now full-time from home and not going out to the traditional nine to five and having that break time, even, even though it's work, but having that interaction with people outside the home, it can feel isolating. You can feel alone, like, hey, nobody knows what I'm going through on a daily basis. I'm ready to pull my hair out because my toddler's getting into everything and I can't have five minutes to get a, lot, a load of laundry done. I'm pulling my hair out because we can't find a breakthrough treatment with my spouse's illness because his because he's not responding well and they're just going through over and over with no results and he's just feeling worse I can't I'm feeling overwhelmed because um I feel guilty for not bringing in money from inside the home anymore because I'm a full-time mom versus a working mom um, I'm feeling overwhelmed because 
um, I'm not feeling well and I'm the one that should be caregiving and I, that's the caregiver and the mom and I need to be 100%, but I don't feel 100%. So I just need to push myself through to make it stop. <laughs> it's okay. It's going to be okay. You just need to find your ebb and your flow and it's not going to happen overnight and that's okay. So no two people are the same. Give yourself some grace. And if you need help, reach out for help because it is available. It is available. You do not have to go through this alone. I don't want you to go through it alone. So, and if you need some love and positivity, you know, check out, check out um, uh, the Resilient Love podcast frequently because it <laughs> sounds like they have a lot of extra stuff to give you a little, you know, pep talks too, if you need it. So. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Guys, you need to go over there because she just pepped us up right now. <laughs> Uh, but again, thank you all so much for listening. Uh, make sure you share this, leave us a five-star review, and catch us on the next one. This has been another episode of Resilient Love. Thank you.